the teacher opens the door. But you must enter by yourself. You are tuned in to Moon Channel. This week's episode, how to be a non-toxic gamer, and what gaming communities and developers can do to address toxicity in gaming culture. I understand how you feel. Maybe somebody linked this to you, or you've looked this video up after a frustrating game and you aren't looking to get talked down to. Well, it's not my intention to talk down to you or to condescend you. Despite appearances, at times, I myself can be a toxic gamer without meaning to be one. I want to talk with you, not at you, in order to share what I've come to understand about toxicity in gaming. Stick with me and let's dissect what it means to be a toxic gamer and how we can be non-toxic together. Let's start by looking at some history for context. In 2018, the Oxford English Dictionary declared toxic its international word of the year. Catherine Connor Martin, the company's head of U.S. Dictionaries, noted that the Word of the Year committee had initially considered choosing toxic masculinity until she realized how widespread the concept of toxic had become. Toxic is an old word. It derives from the Greek toxicon pharmakon, meaning poison for arrows. A toxicon in this context, however, refers to the arrows. The earliest known use of toxic, as we understand it, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, was in 1664. And for centuries, the word toxic referred only to literal poisons. It wasn't until 1913 that toxic became used in a more metaphorical sense when the 1913 Sunday Evening Post referred to the toxic carelessness of men dulled by long hours in an article about workplace injuries. The word toxic then exploded in the 1980s due to the inclusion of the metaphorical definition of the word in self-help books. The 90s furthered this trend with terms such as toxic debt and toxic bachelors. And of course, in 2003, Britney Spears released her song, Toxic. The word toxic has a fascinating history of use. That said, let's go all the way back to that first use, the Greek word toxicon, in reference to arrows. Just like a slung arrow, being toxic lends itself to an offensive action, inflicting injury on another person. We can see this in the colloquial definition of a toxic relationship. Dr. Lillian Glass coined the term toxic relationship in her 1995 book, Toxic People. And I quote, a toxic relationship is any relationship between people who don't support each other, where there's conflict and one seeks to undermine the other, where there's competition, where there's disrespect and a lack of cohesiveness. It's a mouthful, so let's simplify it. A toxic relationship is a relationship where the parties in the relationship aren't working together, but are instead competing and conflicting against each other. Just from this definition alone, we can already learn a great deal about the nature of toxicity in gaming as well. As I confessed to earlier, I am a toxic gamer. More accurately, I should say that I can be a toxic gamer. Not always, but sometimes. You too almost certainly are a toxic gamer at times as well. And that's okay. At times we can all fall victim to that kind of behavior. The first step is recognition. But even with recognition, the compulsion to act in toxic ways is natural and will require active resistance and discipline to overcome. Let's start by breaking down gaming toxicity into two categories, behavior and communication. Behaviors are acts of gameplay that affect the game's community as a whole, whereas communications are interpersonal dialogue or actions outside of the scope of gameplay, and these tend to affect individual players present. Now these can be further broken down into what I would call cooperative and then toxic behavior slash communication. So what do I mean by this? A cooperative behavior is one that builds the community. This is playing fair, playing within the spirit of the game, playing within the spirit of the community. A toxic behavior is one that hurts the community, playing unfairly, breaking the spirit of the game and its community. Likewise, a cooperative communication 
is one that acts constructively on the relationship between individual gamers. A toxic communication is one that hurts or is destructive to the relationship between players, be it on your own team or the opponents. Simply put, cooperative communication or behavior tends to be helpful and builds. Toxic communication or behavior tends to be selfish and tears down. Now, returning to toxic relationships for a moment, a toxic relationship is defined as a relationship where parties in a relationship are competing and conflicting against each other instead of working together. What then is a team game or a gaming experience with other players, such as a friendly speedrun race, but a very short-term relationship? Whether you're playing a MOBA like League of Legends, a first-person shooter like Counter-Strike, a co-op game of Don't Starve Together, or even Stardew Valley. As long as a relationship is formed, however briefly, between two living people, the possibility of toxicity may arise. In what ways, though, do we see toxicity in gaming? At the surface level, it seems simple. Working with our definition, behavior or communication that is cooperative and constructive is non-toxic and communication that is competitive and conflict-seeking is toxic. But the gaming relationship isn't a typical relationship, now is it? In, say, a relationship between two lovers, a competitive side to communication is counterintuitive. After all, if the goal in a relationship is growing together, the pursuit of a union of two people into one life, then to what end does it serve to be competitive? And yet, in a video game, often there is competition injected into every aspect of the game. We see this most often with games designed to be competitive, such as Counter-Strike, Dota 2, or Rocket League. But even in games like Stardew Valley, we see little nudges that can push players to become competitive with each other. Whenever you donate a gemstone, the game tells you who donated it. Whenever somebody gets an achievement, it announces it to all the players present, just like in real life. Available spouses are limited, and you may wish to court the same person. While not, perhaps, intended to be a competitive nudging, these announcements, these gameplay features, can be the spark that ignites feelings of jealousy, envy, or frustration in players. That said, even in the most competitive games, there needn't be competitive communication, only competitive behavior. Naturally, you want to win. But the way you communicate and behave doesn't have to be competitive, it can always be cooperative instead. Let's look at a few tournaments of Super Smash Bros. Melee together. Here you can see that at the end of a typical match, the players will, regardless of their feelings towards the game itself, exchange a handshake or fist bump to show each other respect. This is what I like to call a cooperative communication. This type of communication is helpful, it's encouraging. It is respectful, and it builds community between opponents and teammates alike. In that way, it is constructive for a community. On the other hand, let's look at this game between players Mewtwo King on the right side of your screen, playing as Princess Peach and Nintendoot on the left, playing as the Ice Climbers. Here we see one player behaving in the game itself in what I would argue is a toxic way. This technique is called wobbling. I know many of you Smash Melee players just cringed a little bit. Now, wobbling is a technique that allows a player playing the character Ice Climbers to infinitely grab and combo an opponent without any possibility of escape. It has long been a controversial move in the Smash Brothers Melee community, with many a debate as to whether this conduct should be banned outright. From an inexperienced player's perspective, though, from a potential new community member looking in, I have to say, it's not a good look, and it seems to be abusing an unintended interaction in-game for a competitive edge. Now, all sports have similar conduct and behavior that is within the rules of the game, but not within the spirit of the game. Diving in soccer and football, traveling in basketball, and wobbling with ice climbers in Smash Brothers Melee are all examples of toxic behavior in-game. All of these behaviors occur within the framework of the rules, although only just barely, and are sometimes policed, but often aren't. And all of these behaviors take away from their relative games. 
Back to our Smash Brothers game now, players who find themselves on the losing side of wobbling grow increasingly frustrated. Sometimes players will just give up and walk away from the game altogether. You can see here that this wobbling victim is now engaging in toxic communication. He disengages from the game, shares a frustrated look with the crowd, or refuses a handshake or fist bump from the offending player. Let's distinguish between both kinds of toxicity here again to really bring the point home. When one player chooses to use Ice Climber's wobbling, that is to say the unbreakable chain throwing technique, this player is engaging in toxic behavior. Once again, that is actions in the game itself or occurring within the framework of the game that are toxic. When the player getting wobbled then chooses to disengage from the game, stand up and walk away, or act disrespectfully, that player is engaging in toxic communication. Both of these are an issue, and each should be considered by oneself as a gamer and the respective communities. Let's take a look at some more specific examples to see the difference. MOBAs, or multiplayer online battle arena games, are famous for being especially toxic. These are team-based games which require careful coordination and skilled play from all players on one's team. It's very easy for a single mistake from a single player to cause their team to suddenly collapse. Let's take a look at an example of toxicity occurring in a MOBA together. Let's say you're playing your favorite MOBA. It's a three-lane map, and you're in the top lane soloing. You've been decisively winning your lane, and so you push out a little bit. Suddenly out of the blue, you're ganked, meaning killed, in an ambush, by an enemy that has come all the way from the middle lane. The advantage you worked hard to build is lost and replaced by a substantial disadvantage. How do you react? It's obviously toxic if you type an insult or condescending statement into global chat to insult the enemy team or your own teammates. Well, this kind of communication is destructive. You could argue that it helps your team win, but very notably whether or not the communication helps your team win is not implicated in whether or not a communication or behavior is toxic. The communication or behavior's effect on in-game victory is irrelevant to whether or not it is toxic. Thus, using techniques such as trash talking to encourage tilting, which means frustrating, your opponents is encouraging toxicity. But I digress. It's not controversial to call this communication toxic. However, what if you start pinging middle lane? You ask your team in team chat, why didn't anyone call middle missing in action? We even doubled down on the question marks to emphasize your exasperation. This communication is also toxic. It appears constructive on the surface. You're giving your team advice. However, two points are at issue here. The exasperation of your communication is not going to be taken constructively and you are also not addressing your responsibility in the outcome of the gank. The purpose of this communication is catharsis. That is to say, it makes you feel good. It's like losing your temper and punching a wall or having a tantrum in real life. It releases one's own frustration selfishly to the detriment of others. So don't angrily ping metal after being ganked. Save pings for important constructive communication. Instead, maybe while you're respawning, try something like, I'm sorry, I didn't see that gank coming. I might need your help spotting those in the future. If you see mid missing in action, please let me know. In this way, nobody feels offended by your statement. You are not placing blame on mid lane for not helping. The enemy's successful gank, after all, is not the fault of any individual, but a failure of the team. It's important to manage the character of your message to make sure that the communication doesn't come across as toxic. So now that we know what toxicity is and how to identify it, what can we do to reduce toxicity? Let's talk first to game developers. Game developers should identify and seek to remove especially toxic in-game behaviors from competitive play, such as unintended character interactions, glitches, or meta-breaking inbounds. Failure to address these issues will damage both the reputation of the game and the spirit of the game, thereby weakening the community, injecting communicative toxicity into the game, and ultimately driving constructive players away, further concentrating the toxicity that remains. The end result is that fewer new players join the community. Important pillars of the community start to leave. And 
no amount of new content or advertising spending can fix that issue. Toxic behavior in a game, if enabled by the developers by failure to act against it, will end up poisoning the well. Failure of a community to address toxic behaviors can work in a similar fashion. Let's look at three examples, starting first with Super Smash Bros. Melee. Melee used to be arguably the most popular and most prestigious fighting game to participate in. Released in 2001, Melee has seen remarkable longevity for a fighting game, having been a staple at tournaments since its release. Melee also features a very high skill ceiling, with techniques such as wave dashing, L cancelling, and short hopping being used in high level play. So what separates these advanced techniques and makes them non-toxic when wobbling, as seen before, might be considered toxic? Well, the answer is simple. It's not that those advanced techniques are completely non-toxic. Toxicity in gaming operates on a spectrum. These advanced techniques, arguably exploits in game physics, can lock out new players coming in and prevent the community from growing. That said, they are also fun to practice and master. They make games exciting to watch and give games longevity that only comes with difficulty of mastery. Notably, Wave Dashing and L Cancelling were both removed from the subsequent Smash Brothers games, with Smash Brothers creator Masahiro Sakurai stating that he felt these techniques made the gap between beginner players and advanced players too large. There's some toxicity calculus involved here, and the answer isn't always obvious. What makes these techniques different, then, from Ice Climbers wobbling in Melee, or even competitive Bayonetta in Smash Wii U? The difference is that the degree of toxicity is so much higher in techniques like wobbling or extremely overpowered characters like Bayonetta. It feels unfair to play against. It becomes boring to watch. And ultimately, it is inarguably more toxic to the community as a whole than it is constructive. Gaming communities that fail to police toxic gameplay behavior in their scenes shall see that toxicity affect both veteran players and new players coming. In the end, this can irreparably damage the game's community. How do we heal the toxic wound in gaming culture? How can we reduce toxic communication? There's a community and a game developer side, but also a very personal side. Well, game developers can reduce toxic communication by reducing the potential for toxic behavior in a game's mechanics. By identifying good in-game reporters and fast-tracking their reports. By providing positive reinforcement for individuals with low toxicity either as represented through reports or other in-game systems. A gaming community can reduce toxicity by understanding and correctly utilizing report systems, by policing toxic gameplay behaviors in their own communities, and by rewarding sportsmanship and fair play. That said, no matter how much a community or dev team works at reducing toxic communication, the buck still falls on you and me. It's our job to try and minimize toxic communication in games by understanding what makes us angry and how we can be more constructive in how we talk to others and act towards others. Let's put some guidelines for interpersonal communication here in a nice bulleted list. Number one, don't respond to toxicity with toxicity. If you have to retort, try and engage a toxic player with kindness. Otherwise, Try to keep quiet. Don't build upon further toxicity with your own. And before you communicate, number two, ask yourself, is what I'm about to do or say selfish or helpful? Is your calling out mid lane going to help the team or are you trying to get out your frustration at having died? It might help to take your anger out on playing the game more carefully or in a more focused manner. Maybe you can have a stress ball near you to squeeze as you play. Perhaps you can take a moment to think about what killed you, reflect and make a game plan, and direct that frustration into productivity. There are many anger management techniques to try, I'm not going to list them all here. But pick your favorite and try to utilize that the next time you feel frustrated. 
everyone is the star of their own show. Number three, try not to offend any egos in your words or actions. Number four, always focus on what you can do and not what others can do for you. This will improve your own play and your life as a whole. If you've done some introspection and truly feel like there is nothing you could have done and wish to advise a teammate, do so respectfully. And if they choose not to take that advice, let it go. Pressing on the issue does not encourage them to take the advice. It'll only cause them to fortify their position on the matter. Lastly, try to remember that some things just can't be helped. Some games won't be won. Some players will not wish to be non-toxic, and some games will have imbalanced toxic behaviors that never go patched and are completely unmonitored. But be a part of the solution by not engaging in toxic behavior or communication, and try to constructively address toxicity by bringing it respectfully to the attention of your community, by reporting toxic communications or behaviors through in-game reporting systems, and by treating others the way you'd wish to be treated, the most important thing of all. Undoubtedly, there are more pointers on how to be non-toxic, but I think you get the idea. It's about acting and behaving in a respectful, unselfish way. It'll improve your gameplay, yourself, and those around you. Gaming has a long, long history of toxicity. There will always be some toxicity in video games. Some gamers enjoy it, some even make their living off of it. And within reason, all of that is fine. Removing toxicity from gaming completely is impossible, just as it would be impossible to completely eliminate toxicity from human nature. That said, if gaming wants to be taken more seriously as a mainstream hobby, and if gamers want to be looked down upon less, it helps us all to work together and reduce the issue of toxicity in gaming by striving to be less toxic in our own communications and behaviors. Mass censorship is not the answer. Neither is reducing communication to becoming mere emotes. A game dev engaging in these tactics might be removing toxicity, but there are costs outside of the toxicity calculus that are also worth considering there. That said, Communities should be willing to call out toxicity when they see it, and work on excluding toxic behavior from their communities. Game developers should be willing to patch out toxic gameplay elements quickly, and with proper explanation as to their decisions. And us players, we should do what we can to be non-toxic ourselves, while also being careful not to add to toxicity when other players choose to be toxic towards us. When we play games, Let's try our best to be constructive and unselfish. Let's try to avoid toxic gameplay behaviors and toxic communications. Together, we can make gaming slowly an increasingly non-toxic hobby. Thank you for tuning in to the second episode of Moon Channel. A special thank you to Piercing Sight for our new logo and banner. To our musicians featured on this episode, including Kumu Music and Nix the Shield. To Riot Games, Blizzard Entertainment, and Nintendo for footage. And to viewers like you, thank you. The Moon Channel is very new to the world, and we're still getting our bearings. If you enjoyed today's show and would like to support my work, please consider a like, subscribe, or Patreon contribution. If you enjoyed any of the music used in today's show, please check the video description and show those artists some love. Your support keeps the moon rising. My middle sister has a fondness for a game called Killer Queen. It's an indie arcade game and was developed by John DeBonis and Nikita Mikros of Bumblebear Games in 2013. The game has a rather unique premise. In Killer Queen, 10 players compete against each other in two groups 
of five. Each team has one queen and four drones. The objective of the game is to win in one of three ways, either kill the enemy team's queen three times, gather enough berries to fill your hive, or deliver a snail to a goalpost. The game has a small but very devoted community. It's a pretty fun game. I remember enjoying it very much the first few times I played it, but I never really got into it. I believe it was the summer of 2016, though I could be wrong. I was attending a game developer conference in New York City as an attendee, both to relax after a long week of work, but also to support my sister, who was at this conference herself in order to support her own Killer Queen community. This game developer conference would feature several arcade machines produced by Bumble Bear Games, including two Killer Queen machines. Several of the best Killer Queen teams would be there as well, and a tournament was supposed to be held later in the day. I walked around the conference, admiring the different indie projects being worked on before finally wandering over to the Killer Queen cabinets to see what was a buzz. My middle sister was nowhere to be seen, but I did see my youngest sister there, in one of the cabinets, thrashing with a joystick, frustration visible in both her furrowed brow and the erratic movements of her character on the screen. I looked at her team and saw a hodgepodge group of players, a young girl, a high school student, an older gentleman, a college student, and saw on each of their faces an expression of frustration and bewilderment, mirroring that of my youngest sister. I had walked into the game at just about its halfway point, but before I had much of a chance to even register what was going on, the game was over. Defeated and exasperated, the team disbanded and wandered away, all but my sister. She stood at the cabinet and stared at it angrily. On the other cabinet, the competing team was all young adults of about the same age. They high-fived each other, laughed loudly, and complimented each other on their gameplay. One player scoffed, it's like taking candy from a baby. I returned my gaze to the other cabinet just in time to see my youngest sister finally departing it with a scowl on her face and anger in her eyes. I hadn't seen my sister angry like that very often, so I approached her and asked her what was wrong. She told me that she had spent the last 10 or 15 minutes getting beaten over and over and over again by the team at the other cabinet, the New York City Killer Queen team's number one championship team. She told me that this number one team was hogging the other cabinet, refusing to allow other players the chance to try the game, and beating up team after team of new players trying the game for the first time. My youngest sister and her ever-developed sense of justice took to the other cabinet to try and lead the new players, teach them the controls, give them a fighting chance against the veteran players on the other cabinet. The veterans were utterly remorseless though, she said. They would pull out advanced techniques like hovering against helpless new players, all the while laughing loudly to themselves about their easy victories and how said new players were not utilizing these in their minds simple tricks. So after comforting my younger sister and making sure she had moved on from Killer Queen, I kept myself occupied at a nearby cabinet for a game called Black Emperor. In between games of Black Emperor, I watched as players continued to trickle into try the Killer Queen cabinet only to be quickly defeated by the championship team. Not a single player bothered to try a second game. Some, not understanding at all how to even play or what the goals were, were getting stomped by this veteran team and they just elected to walk away from the cabinet altogether, halfway through a match. Eventually, having run out of willing prey, the veteran team disbanded. Slowly, the Killer Queen arcade cabinets picked up new players and before long, two newbie teams were facing off against each other and having a wonderful time. There was laughter, camaraderie, and joy, the very feelings that built this Killer Queen community to begin with in a time before competitive leagues and before championship teams. Now, Killer Queen remains a very niche arcade game with a core group of devotees. The community itself is diverse, charming, and energetic. My middle sister loves it utterly and misses the time she has spent with her Killer Queen friends. The current pandemic has made in-person matches difficult. And yet, for my youngest sister and I, that single toxic moment we witnessed shall forever stain our impression of Killer Queen and its community, despite all the joy and good we've seen come out of it as well. It doesn't take that much toxicity to scare away newcomers. It often takes only a single 
bitter taste. And you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, as the saying goes. Thank you for tuning in. Be it for yourself, for others, or for the communities you love, I hope you shall always find a reason to be non-toxic.